basically, who wouldn't want uh, their own personal C-3PO R2-D2? No, right. everyone. You, I, wants to go right, home. I, the sky is still the color of early morning steel when the factory lights flicker on. Conveyor belts hum, arms swing, parts glide into place with the rhythm of a mechanical symphony. Then, behind a safety line and a glass partition, something steps forward that isn't a car or a jig or a gantry crane. It looks, at first glance, like one of us. Height, stance, proportions. A head that turns, hands that flex, feet that press down with intent. You can hear the faint whir of actuators as it begins to walk, not like a cartoon robot, but with a cadence that's becoming eerily, unmistakably human. This is Tesla Optimus, and if you believe the people building it, this isn't just a new product, it's a new workforce, a new platform, a new way for ideas to get hands and feet and go do things in the world. Let's start with what is it before we jump to what it changes. Optimus is Tesla's humanoid robot project, full-size, bipedal, meant to live where people live and work. It's not science fiction anymore. We've already watched it evolve from a clumsy early prototype into a more coordinated machine with smoother gait, more precise hands, and the body control you need to carry real payloads and do real jobs. Tesla's official Gen 2 reel showed off a lighter chassis, an articulated neck, improved balance, and notably more capable hands. Since then, short update clips have highlighted a more confident walk and major hand redesigns aimed at dexterity rather than raw brute force. You can think of Optimus as an inversion of Tesla's original bet. The company started by electrifying something we all already understood, a car, and then packed it with software. With Optimus, Tesla is doing it the other way around, starting with software, perception, planning, control, all trained on mountains of real-world data, and then giving that software a body that can work where we work. Car factories, warehouses, loading docks, eventually kitchens and living rooms. The point is not that a humanoid form is cool, though it absolutely is. The point is that a humanoid form can, in principle, use the world we have already built for humans. Stairs, door handles, forklifts, carts, tools, without demanding we rebuild civilization for robots. But how good is it today? Judging by the recent update videos and commentary from the team, the answer is getting steadily better at the fundamentals that matter. Gait and balance, smoother. Hands, a step change in dexterity, thanks to a forearm-driven tendon design and 22 degrees of freedom in the new hand architecture. The goal isn't juggling knives, it's fastening bolts, gripping odd shapes, turning knobs, plugging in cables, picking and placing components, and doing all of it safely, repeatably, predictably. In one demo clip, an Optimus hand catches and manipulates a tennis ball. In another, you can see the hips and knees absorbing each step with a motion profile that's less robot skitter and more human stride. None of these on their own is jaw-dropping, but taken together, they're a clear sign the team is pushing toward the holy trinity of useful robots, balance, dexterity, and reliability. Zoom out to the bigger promise. Elon Musk has said, repeatedly that he expects Optimus to become a huge part of Tesla's long-term value, even projecting that a majority of the company's worth could eventually come from robots rather than cars. He's floated timelines in interviews and on social media that, if you take them at face value, put thousands of units into internal use and pilot programs before broad commercial sales, with a price target in the tens of thousands rather than hundreds. Ambitious? Of course, but this is the same playbook Tesla used for cars. Build first for itself, prove utility on the inside, and then open the gates. Recent reporting and investor notes suggest the internal aim is to have Optimus doing basic factory tasks at scale before a wider rollout. Supply chain wrinkles, including rare earth magnet licensing drama out of China, are real friction points, but they are the sort of problems that companies solve when the economic upside is obvious. So what does a day one Optimus actually do? Imagine the boring jobs you and I don't want to do and that factories struggle to fill consistently. Unloading totes, shuttling parts from A to B, tending a station where the work is mind-numbingly repetitive but still requires human-like motion. Pick, orient, insert, 
press, verify, repeat. The only reason so many of these stations still require people is that traditional robots, those orange industrial arms, are monsters of precision but dumb about context. They'll do the same motion perfectly 10 million times as long as nothing moves or changes. Put a slightly bent bracket on the tray and you need a human. Place the box two centimeters off and you need a human. Replace the fixture, update the whole cell. The prize for Tesla is a robot that can handle light variants the way a human can, guided by cameras, fed by neural nets, adapting to a messier world. Now, let's walk into the near future and make it personal. You get home from work, the house is quiet, a pair of shoes by the door needs to be put away, packages need to be brought in from the porch, the dishwasher is full, and your dog's water bowl is empty. You don't tell your home to do these things. You ask the world's most literal assistant, who lives in your home, to do them for you. Optimus, bring the packages to the kitchen island. The robot walks, slowly but steadily, out the front door, collects the boxes, and returns. Its hands pivot and flex just enough to maintain a safe grip. The packages land on the counter with a soft thump. Optimus, please top off the dog's water. It grabs a pitcher, pours, checks the level with a quick glance from its cameras. Somewhere inside, a bit of code ticks from expected to done. You haven't asked for anything extraordinary. You've asked for something that, in a human household, is almost insulting to ask another person to do. But that's the point. A robot that does ordinary tasks is extraordinary. The obvious question is, how does it know what to do? Tesla's secret weapon isn't the metal, it's the model. The core software stack, the same family of neural nets that's learning to drive by watching the world at scale, gives Optimus a foundation in seeing and understanding scenes. Where objects are, where edges are, what motion looks like, which trajectories are safe. That same learning from video approach is portable. A car camera sees a cyclist and a curb, a robot camera sees a cup and a countertop. The problem class is identical. Take the raw world, convert it into a map of stuff and intent, and choose an action. As those models get smarter, Optimus gets smarter without anyone swapping hardware. That's the soul of a software-first robot. If you're thinking, this still sounds expensive, you're right, for now. Humanoid robotics is notoriously tricky, and until recently, insanely pricey. But this is exactly the kind of domain Tesla loves, because the cost curve bends under volume. Motors, gear reductions, sensors, compute, harnessing, castings. Tesla has deep experience turning expensive bill of materials into affordable, scalable parts. The Gen 2 bot was already lighter and more integrated than the first gen machines, and the hand redesigns suggest an aggressive push to reduce part counts while upping function. You can almost hear the manufacturing group asking the same question it asked when the Model 3 hit the ramp. How do we build a million of these? The team's answer will look like tighter integration, fewer unique parts, common actuators across joints, and a robot designed from the beginning for assembly by robots. That's not poetry, that's a flywheel. Let's talk capability in human terms. Height roughly in the 5'8 neighborhood, mass around what a smaller adult weighs, walking speed that tops out at a brisk human stroll, carrying capacity enough to move boxes and bins without breaking a sweat, lift capacity enough to be useful but not dangerous in a shared space. Put differently, a worker you could stand next to all day without fear, a helper who can hold the other end of the couch, a teammate who can go up a short flight of stairs and return with the thing you forgot, that's the design center. Safety, utility, approachability, not superhuman strength. As the hands improve, so will the usefulness. Operating zippers, pinching cables, turning tiny buttons, squeezing a bottle, two-handed manipulation of awkward things. Every tick upward in dexterity opens 10 new jobs robots couldn't do last year. Now, pull the camera back further. What happens when a single optimist becomes 10 and 10 becomes 1,000? Factories stop being bottlenecked by we can't hire for this shift. Warehouses that struggle to keep people on tedious lines start running 24-7. Night shift becomes less lonely because a fleet of quiet coworkers do the dull stuff while humans triage the weird cases, the break fix, the improvement ideas. Average time to ship goes down. Injury rates on back-breaking jobs go down. The labor market changes because it always changes when we hand the repetitive tasks to machines. 
and it frees humans to do the pieces we do best. Exceptions, creativity, relationships, design. And at home? The first households to install a general-purpose robot will probably look like early adopters of dishwashers and microwaves. People who'll accept quirks and constraints because they see the upside. They'll learn to stage tasks so the robot can succeed. Clearing floor clutter so it can navigate. Organizing a pantry to make visual recognition easier. Labeling containers. Preferring handles to handleless furniture. Over time, you'll forget you ever made those concessions because the robot will improve and your habits will shift. Instead of building a world for robots, we will meet in the middle. Robots get smarter and we design homes and routines that are robot friendly by default. Of course, there's a shadow to this story that we have to address head on. Jobs, safety, and the ethics of giving a machine a human-like body. The job concern is real. Automation naturally displaces certain categories of work. 